get started, shall we? Get right into the integrity. The creative choice in general uniform design for this game seems to be at best a scattershot. We don't know why this is, and we're suffering from this commander cheek aesthetic. The community does not really like it or approve of it, to be honest. Let's mention the elephant in the room, the missing link to all of our uniform issues, at least for the British faction. In 1937, during the rapid modernisation of the British Army in preparation for the coming conflict, a new uniform was introduced and adopted by the British Army. As we can see with this reference render ground randomly from the internet here, um, this does not exist in some form for us to actually customise our soldiers in my, my company. Not, e it's not even in the single player campaign, it, the stuff there is clearly just being rapidly mocked up with the assets. The battle dress uniform and the economy variation was worn not just by the British Army, but also the Commonwealth and Dominion forces, the free armies uh, from Europe, and uh, even the US forces in the Pacific and uh, East Asia adopted it. Um, even more amusingly, the design was functional enough that in 1944, Nazi Germany also produced a battle dress like this of the same design in limited numbers. Now, I assumed last year naively they get around to introducing even this in the most basic form for, well, one of the three factions of this game, but for the moment, DICE is determined to make more uniform and gear, understandably, to promote the Pacific campaign factions more. Come on, DICE, please, please introduce this battle dress, even in the most basic form. We, it, it, we, it just doesn't feel right not having it in. But let's move on. Let's talk about the placeholder gear we've got in the place of the battle dress that's in my company instead. Frank here, a West Indian or Nigerian soldier, is wearing some form of US Army produced olive drab drill shirt. While factories in the United States and Canada did produce a number of fatigue and drill clothing, as well as the battle dress for the British forces fighting in multiple campaigns around the globe, this shirt here is a US Army shirt that would have been worn in Western Europe or Italy later in the war. Pocket placement, amount of buttons and shirt pocket flaps all indicate this. Here are some of the reproduction examples of the actual shirts used by British and Indian soldiers in the East. After the fall of Singapore and other losses in the Far East, it was concluded the pre-war uniforms were more suitable for policing than active combat service in jungle terrain. A reform program for the uniforms began at once to adapt to the rapidly developing jungle fighting techniques used in Burma and other campaigns in the East. A series of shirts and other jungle friendly uniform items were produced during this time in green. Green battle dress of the economy variant was also produced and worn alongside slouch hats and long sleeve bush jackets by British and Indian forces fighting. These new uniforms would see action in Burma and other campaigns until the end of the war. During the time the switch was made, the old uniforms were kept modified and worn until they fell apart in active service. These shirts made of AI text cloth produced by the United States and India would be the proper replacement for the US Army green shirts as we see here. DICE is using creative license and are not too far from the mark with suggestion for such a thing, but without the context of the campaign or proper articles of clothing to make out the rest of the outfit, this clearly misses the mark. The shirt Frank is wearing is at least something interesting. Part of the modular 1937 mark webbing is being worn with the brain gun magazine pockets giving the shirt some sort of a vague functional reason to exist with the game's British faction. British webbing in-game is spread out on a mix of US Army or paratrooper stuff, no doubt either as a placeholder or simply to spice things up amongst the bland items of clothing we have on offer. They clearly know their stuff, but it isn't applied properly. They've even included the toggle rope, used for making improvised bridges and ladders in the field on one of the outfit sets. It is odd though, as the gear is spread too thin, to try and attempt to spice things up some of the more blander assets in the British faction. Perhaps they simply just do not have enough models or time to create new models. The 1947 pattern webbing was functional and modular in real life, giving the soldier the option to go to battle with the bare essentials or march kitted out for the long haul on campaign. Moving on to another soldier in my company, Stanley here is wearing a jersey pullover jumper. This style of military jumper is quite famous outside the Second World War. A modern version exists and is still used both by the British and other military forces around the globe today. I have a vague recollection myself of my own father wearing the successor of this jumper during his own time as a serviceman in the long time period of the 1980s and early 90s. 
Such sweaters were not just worn by the army, submariners and navy men from both sides of the war also wore these things and due to the deal with the cold weather conditions on the job. Most armies of the conflict had such sweaters to be worn in said conditions. Now let's appreciate the details here with this one. DICE does a good job when they don't go over the top and needlessly pin rifle or submachine gun pouches over things. Strapped to his arm now is clearly a spare with field dressing for applying to any kind of wound that any man can walk away from. A spare field dressing is attached inside the British battle dress for such emergencies. This is perhaps a reference to that. Attached to his webbing belt is also a map case. Map cases were issued to officers and were vital for combat operations and navigation. Officers in the Second World War, like in the First World War, dressed down and made attempts either to not wear or disguise their rank identifiers to prevent being picked off by snipers. Some officers even adapted the same battle dress or drill fatigues of their men on the front lines to their official formal dress uniforms. I strongly suspect the design focus of the British outfits were mainly focused on paratroopers and commandos, in no doubt one of several changes of direction this game has had in its short development time. Considering both the war stories and promotion of the airdrop section of Grand Ops, this seems quite likely. Under his broadly marked helmet is the knitted woolen cat comforter. Soft cloth caps were often worn underneath the helmet by many combatants of the war to keep warm. It could also be used to pad out the decaying line or in a pinch simply secure or make a comfortable helmet that didn't fit. Like the Brodie helmet and the beret, the woolen cap was part of the standard British fighting forces equipment and like the berets is still missing in action from the My Company for the British. It would be a welcome addition to the game, Dice. The Brodie helmet is sporting a crude camouflage cover made from the sack of a sandbag. When helmet covers could not be provided, soldiers still had to improvise with paint, ground up cork and provided with the helmet netting the local fauna and flora. For those wondering why the chin straps of these helmets are pinned up and why the helmets are worn loose, is to prevent a tied down helmet from causing neck damage. Some of the early variations of Second World War helmet strap designs either had a dodgy release mechanism and some soldiers did not really want to leave this to chance until this was fixed. It was to prevent the force of explosions from lifting the soldier's loose helmet and damaging or breaking their neck. Finally speaking of MIA things, attached to the gator on his right calf of what first comic book looks like a hip flask to sip a tricky dram of whiskey or rum from is a low resolution gammon grenade. Essentially a missing anti-tank grenade which would be made more sense for the British than the German bundled grenade gadget all factions are still using at the very moment. Next is Michael, a soldier from either the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Force or the Gurkhas. Wearing one of the established US Army drill shirts, he also seems to have grabbed some canvas weapon with a stick magazine pouch attached to it. Amusingly, the belt is not only from the US Army paratrooper set Dice is using as a major placeholder set here, but the belt has not been painted with blanco to form any form of camouflage. Still, he's got the field dressing attached to the camo netting on his Brody Mark II helmet to keep him from being too injured. Seeing what Frank and Michael are equipped with, Dice are trying to suggest a concept of British soldiers on the front line dressing down in fatigue denims or drill wear doing support or sentry work, or even soldiers cut off from supply depots during fighting having to use spares or fatigue replacement uniform items. In a way, they should be congratulated for making people remember the existence of such uniforms outside the scope of popular media. Second World War entertainment media has a nasty habit of focusing and attaching to things that look good as a visual shortcut. One of the proposed features of this game was shining a light on some things other Second World War popular media seem to gloss over or forget. Even minor things like uniforms and equipment do count. I appreciate this direction and with proper focus and actual needed correct clothing this can be both authentic to the setting and unique in itself. Problem is without the battle dress and correct webbing and headgear as a template things sort of fall apart fast or look strange without the context. Strapping improvised webbing to random US gear does not however really work. Captured weaponry and gear being used by both sides in a pinch due to being cut off from conventional supply lines was a thing now, but this crude shot care has been used way too many times and just looks comically overdone. Next up is Christian wearing part of the Wild One set, purchased from the in-game store. I have attempted to replicate a sort of ad hoc early war commando look here. Trying to make good looking soldiers but needing to purchase boys is sadly a harsh reality with this game. It would certainly not be so sad if better or more authentic gear was provided in the in-game store. Leather coat is certainly something an early war commander raider would wear in a cold or wet weather during a night raid. Said coats and jackets were also worn by other specialist infantry and pilots in both the Allies and Axis of the war, sometimes even lined with fur for extra warmth. The 
The proof of my theory about the creative intent of this outfit is mini being the climbing gear, only issued to commando and necessary operatives who were trained to use such equipment, wrapped around his chest and some other tools attached to his webbing. With the right beret, I would certainly say this would be close to a battlefield stylized commando with the limited options available. I have used the Marine Paratrooper Beret with the Tides of War reward pool due to lack of authentic headgear available. A black or white beret or even the woolen cat comforter would all be better authentic choices for this look. Commander gear was unique and different from each regiment, with their focus being on the equipment being durable and functional for their missions. Unique regimental headgear or insignia was also added if the said commander had such historical origins or associations. US Special Forces such as the Rangers worked and fought alongside British Special Forces in Western Europe and even adopted and adapted some equipment from their experiences. The forces and scouts that would eventually become the commandos were operating as early as the Normandy campaign in the war and actually wore and used some of the more exotic lesser known cold weather gear DICE has picked up and put into the game. Though the white parka was perhaps more common, the US Army mounting units were also provided with the same sort of modern looking cold weather gear as well. More regular British infantry down outside the mountain fighting wore sheepskin jackets or vest jerkins over their battle dress in the campaign however, alongside several greatcoats. Without context again, or the sadly missed codex in the previous game, the more common variations like the sheepskin or free issued greatcoats, DICE misses the mark and makes it seem once again they are tossing any random stuff against the wall, which sadly is not helping their case at all. Quick switch over to Stanley now again who is wearing a motorcycle reconnaissance helmet here with one of the loose free French resistance outfits DICE added to the store. Slightly off topic for the moment, but a Triumph motorcycle would be an excellent choice to bring to the game. Battlefield 1 had motorcycles, so why not? This helmet, worn without the shell, was sometimes adopted for use by British tank crews and would be a more logical choice for the in-game's tank crew uh, for the British rather than a wrongly coloured beret which is just being used as a placeholder now. The correct tanker beret, which was black, would be an easily fixed to implement. On the brief subject of tank crews still, giving them the battle dress when introduced, or even just the current Pacific faction US tanker stuff with the right shade of khaki brown, would be a much better placeholder for the character model for the time being. Also, while as a pain in the ass, the RAF pilot having his proper uniform or even just blue trousers and a leather flight jacket would much be appreciated dice. Now, let's switch outfits up a second. Christian is now wearing something that sort of shows DICE either ran out of development time or budget before the game's early launch. Christian here is cosplaying a rather poor paratrooper. The famous Denison smock sadly is missing and has been replaced by one of the US Army shirts in a vague sort of pattern that resembles it, I guess? The webbing has been comically overloaded, not sure what he has the ammunition box for, but there is not enough room for the browning machine gun belt he's got carrying attached to himself, slung comically over his shoulders. This sadly is the reward for maxing out the support class for the British faction. I am using the US paratrooper styles because it just looks a lot less awkward with the other set stuff provided. DICE has actually made the proper British paratrooper outfit, but it's lurking in the files that it was associated with the both dead and pointless 5 vs 5 mode that they spent several months working on that has been cancelled. It's a damn shame because it uses one of the several variations of paratrooper helmets the British Army field during the conflict, so there was some intent to actually bring in a proper paratrooper outfit at some point. The Battlefield community has been constantly requesting a plain paratrooper beret alongside a certain French First World War light machine gun for the last year now, it would be nice if both was delivered soon, as soon as possible. And finally, to end the video on a fun note, we're going to briefly cover my own personal guilty pleasure here with Stanley, which is so over the top I actually kind of enjoy. Yes, he has a gas mask. It is an understatement, but at this point, both somebody has a tactical call or borderline sexual fetish for gas masks in their art or development team. Jokes aside though, they are no doubt happy to push articles of face covering clothing to hide the fact they do not have the time or resources to introduce a few more soldier variations of either gender to the game systems, hence the usage of these things. 
Gas masks, however, were sadly used during the conflict, and not on the scale of the previous war now, but they did exist, and they have a reason to be here. Imperial Japan conducted chemical warfare and operations against the Chinese. The soldiers were issued and wore gas masks in these horrifying clean-up operations. In early war Western Europe, the masks themselves were issued kit worn and carried for the early part of the conflict at least. On the home front, paranoia led to civilians to using them, playing safe with the bombing on both sides were conducted. Obviously, they were not used or worn while fighting. The previous battlefield games showed how such an awkward concept this can be. What is strange to me is seeing the gas mask strapped or awkwardly pinned to the side of the webbing. That fantasy element will lead to them being damaged or lost. Put them in the provided cans or leather boxes on some of the uniforms. During the later part of the war, these mask containers, if still worn, were used to store all sort of personal effects or small equipment once the gas fear had passed. The thing that amuses me is how over the top the great coat here is. By default, the great coats are already weird in this game, especially the current British factual one, which I strongly suspect but cannot prove is one of the issued coats or large jacket overcoats of the US Army, possibly the Melton. It's hard to tell as the coats are small, open, spread out to a crazy degree and worn over a British Army jersey pullover. It is a pain to identify, I tried honestly, but without it being close to see their buttons or even to see if it's a double or single breasted coat, this thing's a chimera to identify and it's going to take some time still. What amuses me for this variation which you get from maxing out scout for the British side is the fact they only not only took the time to dye it the dark red associated with the British red coats of the past, but even dyed the straps blue to match the coat and sleeve facings of said coats. I assume this soldier is one of the guard, not entirely sure which one, that they have a strange obsession over the wife of the king. The blue markings are regimentally exclusive to soldiers associated with the royal family of the United Kingdom. Oh, and the OOT Union Jack is strapped to the back, which really makes this outfit feel more like an ironic early as hell punk fashion statement, or a really desperate attempt to remind us what side this crazy ass coast belonged to. It's just frankly stupid. But I love it. Shamelessly stupid and dumb. Sadly, however, the tone misses the mark and would really suit a battle royale game instead. Did this coat come before Firestorm or after it? It's at least not very boring, which is to say about a lot of the outfits provided to the British at the moment. Creativity isn't the problem here. It is lack of focus and direction. You can make an authentic uniform look good without pushing it past 11. This should be approached as a challenge. The game's art team should relish such a concept in recreating authentic but stylized uniforms for the game's setting. I do like the spirit and intent behind this example, despite the silly, and like with a lot of the stuff they are trying to do, there is a grain of truth related to the actual history and the fact hidden behind the rushed or clumsy design choices. Looking at the actual uniforms themselves could be inspirational. There are other ways to make a soldier in uniform stand out without it getting silly. Authentic regimental identifiers pinned to lapel sleeves, cloth markers and flashes painted on helmets, they're all interesting concepts worth exploring, art team. Regiments with ethnic identities and traditions themselves adapted and still use certain headgear and other clothing items too in the conflict. DICE really has missed a golden opportunity to make a proper looking, unique, regular and elite faction uniform set and that players would gladly purchase and would, that would not break the immersion of the game's setting. I still feel it would have been worth the effort to even just concentrate on making certain unique but sober outfits tied to either the rank system or company coin system as a proper reward for playing the game in extended periods. Plus, who wouldn't want to have the soldier running around in a British Army style Scottish kilt? And on that note, we end the video. Thank you for listening to my ramblings. Apologies to those hardworking artists out there for me for borrowing images to use as examples in the video. I will give you credit for this and link the sites down below in the description box. If you're actually still here and have some interest, I do suggest picking up some of the ebooks from Osprey or other 